All right, so Jesus, uh, he um, started out back in uh, Matthew chapter 5 with a thing called, we all call the Sermon on the Mount. And in that, he preached a revolutionary message that the God who created all things, who had been the God over their nation, the God of Abraham, the God of the Ten Commandments, the God who had developed their temple, who made them his children, that Jesus introduced to them that to really know him and follow him correctly, you had to find out he was your father. That's where he said, when you pray, pray, our father, my father. He kept, don't pray like the Gentiles do. Don't give like the Gentiles do. Don't like heathens do, like people who don't know him this way. But pray as someone who has a father in heaven. Pray as if you're asking a father, your father. And that was revolutionary for them. They were called the children of Israel, but they had no concept of being sons and daughters of God. They had no concept of this. And Jesus introduced it in the Sermon on the Mount. Out of those sermons he was preaching in those days, the miracles he was doing, he called together a group of men. And followers, and out of that group, he picked 12, and he named them apostles. And here today, we have another discourse that he began when he chose those 12 and then sent them out into Israel to preach this incredibly simple message, the king is here. They had been been the petri dish, the fishbowl for all mankind to hear the message over and over from the prophets through the law through the temple, through the priesthood, that the king is coming. And he told them to go out and preach a simple message. The king is here. You and I today live in a day that all of those people would love to have been part of. They longed to see the day when every man alive, every child born into this world could have a relationship with the king of kings. And that the Holy Spirit would be available to all men. That it would be that all men could have intimacy with God as a father. That the Holy Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of the Father and Jesus would come and make its home in us. His home, I shouldn't call it it, that was wrong. Would come and make his home in us. And that we would become the temples of the living God. And as he sent them out to preach this message, this incredibly simple, the king is here. And if you haven't been here for our series, go back and read it. Those who believed and those who didn't believe, those who received and those who didn't receive, he told them to tell them the same message. The king is here. I get to every every week, I get to get up and tell you the king is here. I get to tell you that he's here. And I don't mean in in sort of a radar beam sense. I don't mean it in a feeling. I mean it in reality. For me, Steve Orsillo, I decided long ago, I believe. I didn't one day, and then I did the next. And once I believed, I have never not believed. He showed himself to me. He's real. No, I haven't been real every day of the life since then. He has been real. I have not been faithful every one of those days, and it is many days. It is well over 42 years, coming up on 43 in just a couple of weeks. And he has been faithful every one of those days. The king is here, and I am his witness. I'm not telling you something I heard somewhere. I'm not telling you something I felt one day. I'm telling you something I have experienced and I know to be true. Everything I believe isn't right. Everything I do may not be good, but he is still real. He is still true. He is faithful even when I'm not faithful. And the message is still being preached today. This message that he is here. The king has come. This king requires things. It's very unpopular. I'm about to read you one of those scriptures that everybody says, Ooh, oh, oh no. What's that mean? I wanted to preclude it with, or 
preempt it with or serve it to you first, this message and how important it is. And it is the whole story. He is here. And you'll see from these verses what that causes on planet Earth then and today. You'll see what it causes amongst men. men. You'll see what it causes amongst people who are called together in love. It causes it everywhere. It causes it all the time. And you and I need to quit forgetting these verses. And I'm going to read it to you. You ready? Yes. Matthew chapter 10. I'm just going to jump right into the verse 21 with you. And here it is. Is it up there? Brother will betray brother to death. Rut row. And a father his child. Children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. You who are sent with this message, that's paraphrase, will be hated by all because of my name. But it is the one who has endured to the end who will be saved. Whenever they persecute you in one city, flee to the next. For truly I say to you, you will not finish going throughout through the cities of Israel until the Son of Man comes. We'll just stop right there. And I mean, it should be in most congregations that hear that verse, it should be a collective ouch kind of. You know, like, whoa. Maybe you say, well, my children aren't rising up to kill me, and I didn't rise up to kill my parents. I wonder. I wonder. I know that people hated me for many reasons prior to 1975. Some of, and, and they weren't very good reasons. And then other people hated me for really good reasons. I was hateful, so they just returned the favor. But as a Christian, I have found that people hate me hardly ever for a good reason. Some of them I still earn, but mostly I don't earn it. They just hate me because I preach Jesus. Did you notice in the verse why it said they would hate you? He made it really clear. And I, I, I've been in places where I, I preached religion, and I found that way fewer people hate me when I preach Christianity. But if you just make it about Jesus, it's really shocking how fast they rise up. You try to get them to look at Jesus. I recently had a conversation with a leader who was investigating one of his pastors. And I wanted to write back to them, the people that are complaining about your pastor, it's a good thing Jesus isn't their pastor. Because the things that pastor did was simply preach Jesus. And people don't like that. He uses phrases that are unpopular today. Like how you get to heaven. Who will be saved? Why, it's so much easier to create a religion that says you do nothing. You simply say a 20-second prayer and you're in. Or you simply say you believe. I remember back in the 70s, when I was preaching Jesus everywhere I went, hitchhiking to getting cards to preach Jesus, people I'd say, are you a Christian? And people would say, I'm American, aren't I? What's that got to do with anything? As if a nationality could cause you to be saved. I'm Canadian, aren't I? Yeah, but back to the question. You follow me? I mean, we have so many different things. I have asked quite a few crowds, and I could have asked you, but I didn't want to trap you. What does the Bible say it takes for a man to be saved? And 100% of the people I don't give the answer to first say, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. And the good thing, the good news for all of you who would have said that and would agree with that, it does say that in the Bible. It does say that. The apostles say that. But it says in 13 different places, he who endures to the end will be saved. When I take those two ideals, I think that I must have to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ to the end. 
to be saved. Not just in a moment where I decided and then decided the opposite, or just said, yeah, I believe it's all true. There has to be some explanation for all of these verses saying these things. It must mean, confess that God raised him from the dead. I must have to confess him that God I must have to confess that God raised him from the dead all the way to the end. It says 18 different times. He who endures to the end, he who overcomes to the end will be saved. When you begin to preach the things Jesus said, like that phrase, it's easy for men to rise up. They get really mad at you. People get mad at me for things like saying, follow me as I follow Christ. It's like the thing that makes everybody stirred up the most. I'm like, why? I'm just imitating the apostles that he sent out. Peter the apostle said it. Paul the apostle, the next, the next generation of apostles said it. He required it. If you read his letters, he said, hey, you sound tough now, but wait till I come to you. I'll straighten you out. Nobody likes to hear that stuff. When you preach Jesus and you preach the results of Jesus, the holiness expected of us, be ye holy as your heavenly Father is holy. Be ye perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Well, don't preach that kind of stuff to us, they say. Just tell us how good it is to have a Father in heaven. Well, let me just tell you something straight up. It is really good to have a Father in heaven. It's really good to have a good dad. I'll bet you those of us that had good dads got more spankings than other people. Now, they weren't abuses. Those of us that had good dads got no abuses. And there's a complete difference in those two things. My dad never hit me in anger. But boy, if my mom said, wait till your father gets home... I was hiding sticks everywhere. <laughs> I, I forgot the fact he had a belt around his waist that I couldn't hide. The, the stick was better, actually. But you see, having a good father is a good thing. Having God be your father, it's a good thing. And that's what Jesus is trying to teach us, that God is our father. Relate to him as a father. Learn, those of you that don't know, learn what a good father is. Follow good fathers. See good fathers. Imitate good fathers. Learn what that is. Those of you that can really stick with this, God is a mother. One of his names means the breasted one. He is a good mother. A provider gives life. A life giver is what it means. Well, the difference between women and men is those babies can live without us men. But they need sustenance. They need their mothers. Until formula was invented, but <laughs> that's the creation. The creation makes us so babies need their mothers. Sustenance. Nourishment. God is both male and female. He made man in his own image. And then he split us in two. And Jesus said, go out and tell him the king is here. Go out and tell him. Those that believe and don't believe say the king is here. Those who reject you say the king is here. You had a chance to get this because the king came for you. He came to teach you. He came to tell you. In the planet Earth, since Jesus came, more people have been brutally murdered for the cross than any other subject on the planet. Disagreement over the book is probably second. Disagreement over anointing who is God's man and who isn't God's man has caused so many brothers to kill brothers and children to kill parents and parents to kill children and conflict in the world. 
it's easy to understand what Jesus is saying. When you go to people who think they already have it, and you tell them you need it, and it's here for you to have, you cause all kinds of turmoil in the world. I've never walked down, I've never, I yet, have yet to share Jesus with someone in this neighborhood that didn't already, said they already believed. They already know. Talk to the hand. Oh, absolutely I believe. There is no evidence in your life of belief. If you believe that the king is here, that's a good thing. But if you don't make him your king, then it's a wasted thing. If you believe that the king has come and you make him your king, then you enjoy the benefits of the kingdom come. His will be done right here on earth. We're waiting for this external here on earth when the here on earth that we should be looking for in that prayer is his will being done here on earth just like it is in heaven. God's will is done in me. When we accept that he is king, we do a good thing. But making him our king is the end goal. To say the king is here is good. To say the king is my king, he is my king. I submit to him. That would bear some evidence. There would be evidence that would demand a verdict about me. You'd have to come and look and decide, does he bear the marks of the king? Does he have the nature of the king? To do that, you'd want to know the king. You'd want to know about him. I find that out in the world, they easily know everything I'm supposed to be doing. In the church, I have found very few people know what we're supposed to be doing. It is amazing. We should study the king and see what the mark of the king on a life should be. What is it that a, a life should look like that has a king who art in heaven, who has a father who art in heaven, whose will is being done in them just like it is in his house, in his kingdom, just like it is there? What is the mark? What would it look like? Would it look like chastity? Would it look like purity? Would it look like joy, unspeakable, full of glory? Would it look like peace that passes understanding? Would it look like knowledge? Would it look like wisdom, self-control? Would it look like these things? And do you know what it would look like? Do you know what you're looking for? That, I hope, is why you come to a church on a Sunday morning, why you sit and listen to me for 30 minutes at a time, why you drink it in, why you read this book, why you consecrate yourself to him, why we worship him. I hope it's to begin to acknowledge and to know him better. The eyes of your heart opened up, wisdom and revelation, that you might know him better so that you can recognize him better, so that you can recognize him in the street, so you can recognize him in your aisle, so you can recognize him in your church and in your family, so you can look and see that the fruit growing on your tree is not leavened with the lump of hypocrisy, the leaven of the Pharisees, but is leavened with the kingdom of heaven, which is the king is here. And he lives in me. And he anoints me. And his light shines upon me. So I step forward to say, then I will shine his anointing upon you. And you will step forward and say, I will shine his light upon you. And we become this light that charges Instead of always receding, the 85% church attendance in America 100 years ago that is now 5% or less, or is it 15? I think in America it might be 15, but I'm not sure. I forget. England down to under 2%. Wales down under 1%. Canada losing, churches being closed everywhere. Buildings being emptied everywhere because the church is just taking the light taking the anointing and pulling it back and changing it and have no idea what the king wants or who the king is or what his identity is, what he really says about himself. Out there in the world today, men are destroying the church by rising up against brothers and children against their fathers and fathers against their children. And Jesus is saying, one day when I return, I will turn the hearts of the fathers back towards the children and the hearts of the children back towards their fathers. 
Are you following me? This is the goal of the presence of God being in your midst. Here at the Father's house, we call the, some people call it the Jesus bubble. <laughs> some people call it. I think that's a pretty good bubble to be surrounded by myself. Because we want to know who he is and who, what he is makes me. What it causes in me. The responsibility it calls to me with. The purpose it tells me. The, the anointing, the responsibility that comes into my hands by saying I, the king is here. He is with me. He is in me. He laughs with me. He cries with me. He walks with me. He talks with me. The king is here. And I am his and he is mine. If sons rise up against us, if brothers fight, which they do, if what he just said, his truth is going to bring division, that isn't his truth's fault. It is our choice. It is the world's choice. Why, we as truth carriers have divided our churches. This is the dead straight truth in my day. It's been over the color of the carpet. I know of a church, you think that was from the old days? I know of a church in the last five years that hardly one member goes to it anymore because a new pastor changed the carpet. Dead serious. It's a brand new church. Everyone that was there for 30 years left because he changed the carpet. Brother rises up against brother for nothing. I know people who would not listen to me because of the clothes I'm wearing. I know another group that won't listen to me because the day we gather is Sunday. We're divided by everything. And Jesus said, the truth I send you out with, the truth I bring you with, it's going to bring a sword. It's going to bring division. Because... People are not going to hear the king is here. They're going to say, I already know. It's hard to fill a cup that's already full. I want to be empty so that I might be filled. And if I'm filled, I want to pour myself out so there's room for more. Because I want more. I want to keep going, don't you? He who overcomes to the end. He who endures. I don't want to be hated. It's just a fact of life, of carrying truth, of carrying anointing, of shining light, of calling a duck a duck. Maybe I can explain. For, there's a lot of visitors, but new people that don't know me. You'll never hear me call a duck a duck that hasn't claimed to believe and put themselves in my church. Never you'll see me standing on there protesting anybody for their actions of any kind. But the people that come and say, I'll walk with you, teach me. I'm honor bound to teach them. That's wrong. That's right. This is the way. Walk in it. It's my responsibility. If I don't do that with you, maybe I don't know you're with me. Can I just tell you something? The last thing on earth I want to do in this world is that. It's my responsibility. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me. He's anointed me, called me, to teach you the culture of Jesus, which is what he's doing in there. He said, before you go out, it says before he sent them, he instructed them how to be apostles. He's called me to culturalize you. Last thing I'd want to do is that. Because I don't want to be hated. It's good that he warned me ahead of time. Because I kept going, they hate me for telling them the truth. People that do hate me, I mean. Then I remembered, oh, he said that was going to happen. Seek him and you'll find him. Knock, the door's going to be open for you. Pursue him. Be him. Little Christians, little, little anointed ones, like kind. The king is here. 
He's calling us to be his children. If you're a child of the king, you're a prince or a princess. You're royal, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Your behavior reflects on the king. Your actions reflect on the king. They hated, he said, if they hate me, and the next, the next set is, uh, a student is never greater than his master, and what he's trying to say is, they're going to hate me, they're going to kill me. So don't expect them not to do that to you. That's what he's telling them. I'd like to touch on the very end of this where he said, you won't even go to every town in Israel before I return, before the Son of Man comes. That's the one that's real confusing because it's been a long time. So either he came by this verse or they haven't gone to every town in Israel. I don't really... No, when he says the Son of Man comes, it could mean I'll come get you where you are before you finish the journey. Could mean that. I'll gather you back to me before you get to every town. Or it could mean the second coming and that Israel still needs to be evangelized. They need to hear that their Messiah has come. I'm not sure, can't explain it to you. I'm sure it brings questions to you. It's one of the questions we'll ask him. What did you mean by that in that discourse when you sent out your apostles? Before you go to every town, the Son of Man will come. Was it it coming to us out there or was it you returning? Because they didn't really get it. I don't get it. it'll, It'll pan out in the end and I just wanted to make sure that I admitted that to you. I don't understand some things. I believe what it means is they haven't evangelized all of Israel yet. I believe it's God's will that every single Israelite have a chance to see that their Messiah has come before Jesus returns and closes the door. But I might be wrong. What I see is that if I preach Jesus, the King has come, and He is Jesus Christ. And He is calling us to follow Him He is calling us to raise the dead, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. He's calling us to set men free like he set men free, mankind free. He's calling us to preach the message, the king is here. Bow before the king, long live the king. Hallelujah, the king is here. Behold, my redeemer lives. Hosanna to the one who is able to deliver me. He is calling us to preach, the king is here. And when the king comes, men are set free. And if you're not free, he will set you free. And I have been anointed to preach this good news to you. And the crowd is full of people anointed to preach this good news to you. Lay hands on you and help you be free. That could be free from something hideous, and it could be free from something as simple as biting your fingernails. But free. Could be free from worry. Could be free from fretting. Could be free from sadness. Could be free from a lot of things. An abandonment, orphan spirit, could be a lot of things. But he's come to set you free, nonetheless. And he sent me here to tell you that. And he sent you here to tell others. And to live it before your fellow man, the holiness of God, the perfection of the holiness of God. Once it's been given to you to live it and walk in it. Are you hearing me? The king has come. The king is here. He's here for you. Whether you reject it or receive it, he's here for you. To set you free. To bring you truth. To show you a God who will be your father. Whose will will be done in you just like it is there. If you will do it. If you will allow it. If you will walk in the truth. He's here for you. And I'm excited about that. It's been a ride for 42 years, 43 mostly. I hope I get a bunch more because earth is an awesome place. In spite of all that looks hinky and crazy, earth is an incredible place that needs Jesus. And what better place if you carry Jesus to live in a world that needs Jesus? What a better place to live. Where could there, what could, where could there be a better place? Where could there be 
a perfect fit for people who want to follow Jesus, who want to live him, work in him, shine him out, proclaim the message. My king is here. Long live the king. May I serve him for eternity.